Good evening, and welcome to the Durham City County Planning Commission meeting on January 12, 2016. The members of the Durham Planning Committee have been appointed by the City Council and the, council, and the County of uh, Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials will have the final say on any issue before us tonight. If you wish to speak on an item tonight, please go to the podium to my left and sign up to speak. For those of you who wish to speak, please state your name and your address clearly when you come to the podium to speak. Please speak clearly into the microphone because it, this session is being uh, televised. Each side, those speaking in favor of an issue and those speaking in opposition to an item, will have 10 minutes to present for each side. The time will be divided among all persons wishing to speak. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative, so if a motion fails or ties, the recommendations for denial. Could we have the roll, please? Mr. Busby? Ms. Freeman? Mr. Ghosh? Mr. Gibbs? Mr. Harris? Present. Ms. Huff? Ms. Hyman? Present. Mr. Kitchen? Here. Mr. Miller? Present. Mr. Riley? Mr. Van? Mr. Whitley? Here. Ms. Winders? Here. We have a We have what, nine? Nine. Okay, I have a request for excused absence for Commissioner Van. Commissioner Riley, and possibly Commissioner Gibbs. Could I have a motion that these people be excused? Mr. Chairman, I move that we excuse the aforenamed members. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor of the motion to excuse Commissioner Van, Commissioner Riley, and Commissioner Gibbs, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Thank you. The next thing, do we have adjustments to the agenda? Uh, yes, sir. Good evening, uh, Planning Commission members. Uh, Grace Smith, Durham City County Planning. We do have a couple of adjustments to the agenda. Um, as I previously, previously notified you that case um, Z15-0023, there was a notice in error, so we're going to have, or excuse me, an error notice, I apologize, an error notice that we would have to um, remove that from the agenda tonight and it will be considered next month. So that needs to be removed, 5A needs to be removed from the agenda. And also um, case A15-0020 needs to be moved in front of the cases beginning with A15-0014, 0014. So it would be, in the new order would be um, A through F, but F would become A. Thank you. That, if that's okay with you. And I believe um, Mr. Young has something he would like to speak with the board about now. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Thank you uh, very much. I'll be brief. Uh, it's been my great pleasure to uh, serve as primary staff uh, liaison uh, to the planning department uh, for this board for now going on seven and a half years. Uh, but we have had um, some administrative changes, reorganization within the department. Um, my focus is going to be on uh, the engagement efforts you heard about with the work program last year, customer service, and our administrative reviews and approval subdivision and uh, site plan reviews primarily. So uh, Ms. Smith will here to four be your primary liaison. You will see me in other capacities occasionally. Uh, Ms. Smith is supported by Sarah Young, who is my colleague uh, as assistant director. Uh, I want to thank you all so much. Uh, it's been one of the greatest pleasures and, and best experiences uh, of my time here. And I w I'm not going anywhere, but you won't see me as frequently uh, in this role. And I wanted to thank you. And I'll turn the proceedings over to Ms. Smith uh, when you need staff assistance. Well, thank you, Pat. We certainly, you will be missed. And we still may be calling on you. <laughs> As I said, I'm not going anywhere, but I'm just not going to be in the same role. So thank you all very much. Thank you. And I'd like to add one additional thing on the new business. Uh, as Ms. Smith stated when she sent the notification out about five, item five, she also included a document with reference to the guidelines for the submittal of the development plans and also the committed elements. And I'd like to speak briefly to that uh, under new business. Uh, is there any objections to the uh, adjusted agenda? 
If not, could I get a motion that we approve the, adge approve the agenda with the adjustments? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I have a second. All those in favor of the, the adjusted agenda, please raise your right hand. All those in opposed, raise your hand. Thank you. The uh, minutes was sent out. Are there questions, concerns, corrections on the minutes that were sent out? If not, could I get a motion for approval? Move approval. I have a move to approve by Commissioner Bugsby. Second. Second by Vice Chair Hammonds. All those in favor, let it be known by raising the right hand. All those in opposition, thank you. Okay, as you know, item five, public hearing for the Hope, Va Hope Valley Commons Business Park. If you are here for that particular item, that item will be coming up next month. So if you, if you were here to speak to that item, it will be next month. Item number six, the public hearing for zoning map change request, Straw Valley Z1400033. The chair will now uh, open this up for public hearing and we have staff presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Amy Wolf with the Planning Department, presenting zoning map change case Z1400033, Straw Valley. This request is um, put forth from Scott Bednaz. This is in the city's jurisdiction. The request is from the current designation of office institutional and commercial neighborhood to the designation of MUD or mixed use with a development plan. The site is 4.53 acres and the uh, proposed use is for a mix of uses for office, residential, and commercial. The site is at 5441 New Hope Commons Drive. It has frontage along New Hope Commons Drive, Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard Service Road, and Interstate 40. It is uh, within the MTC overlay, which is the major transportation corridor overlay, uh, which uh, uh, abuts our uh, major intersections. To the north of the site is the shopping center. To the east is a self-storage facility. South is com uh, on the opposite side of Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard is other commercial uses and to the west is interstate. This site is in the suburban transit area known as Patterson Place and it is so designated with the 2005 comprehensive plan which showed a transit stop in this vicinity. The request does meet the criteria for a development plan and satisfy the uh, requirements of the mixed use district. This site will, um, will be vertically integrated. Uh, there's a commitment for that in the phasing plan, which I'll uh, get to in just a moment, but it does satisfy the requirements of the mixed use district and it includes a development plan. The existing conditions of the site are shown on this slide uh, on the left hand side of the slide is the OI district or office institutional which is presently vacant. On the right hand side of the screen is the commercial neighborhood district which is currently uh, uh, commercial uh, development and uh, through the approximately the center is a Hoffler Lane. The proposed conditions meets the criteria for development plans. It shows the proposal for uses and um, other minimum commitments required. Uh, tree coverage will be along Interstate 40. 10% uh, tree coverage is required. There's a 100-foot buffer for the major transportation corridor overlay shown abutting Interstate 40. Um, there's, a gonna, there's a commitment for a relocation of Hoffler Lane. There will be a mix of uses. These dots signify internal pedestrian circulation, and I'd like to go over some of the other commitments of the plan. This is your visual representation. Uh, the site is committed to a maximum of 50 residential units, which puts it at 11.55 dwelling units per acre, a uh, total of 75,000 non-residential square feet, 25,000 being office, and a maximum of 50,000 being commercial uses. There's five access points shown. Those are committed on impervious surface maximum at 100%, which um, 
uh, accounting for a dedication of right of way would be 4.33 acres and tree coverage area of 10 percent graphic commitments are the location of the access points the location of the building and parking envelope the tree preservation area along interstate 40 and the relocation of hoffler lane which is referenced from one of the text commitments as well as shown on the graphic there's a number of text commitments um, there was a transportation impact analysis performed with this review and these commitments address those at durham chapel hill boulevard and mount moriah road there's uh, will be uh, an additional southbound right turn lane there will also be improvements at mount moriah road and new hope commons drive including a traffic signal and other um, ingress and egress improvements i'm not going to read them all to you they are in the staff report uh, for further information there's also improvements proposed at new hope commons drive and site access three which is hoffler lane and pertains to the relocation of hoffler lane and the construction of that um, facility there is a phasing plan with this request it is a mixed-use district and projects within a uh, suburban transit area require a phasing plan this plan um, has identified two phases the first phase will be vertically integrated with anywhere from 1 to 50 residential units and a minimum of 1,000 square feet of non-residential development the second phase will be anywhere from 1,000 to 25,000 square feet of office and 1,000 to 50,000 square feet of commercial other commitments include uh, dedication of right-of-way uh, along the Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard service road as well as uh, accommodations for pedestrian accessible ramps to cross New Hope Commons Drive and transit related improvements that could be identified at the time of site plan there are a number of design commitments that have been proffered with this request design commitments are required of non-residential projects that address the architectural style roof lines building materials any distinctive fi uh, features of the buildings as well as how the building will fit into the context area this request is designated commercial on our future land use map you'll see on this map uh, red will signify commercial uh, designation there is commercial proposed in this development plan and this project and therefore this request is consistent with our future land use map it is also consistent with the applicable policies of the comprehensive plan as identified on this slide and in the staff report and staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other applicable policies and ordinances and staff's available for any questions thank you those people that are standing in the back here's a few seats down here there's also seats to my left up here if you would like to sit down and be a little bit more comfortable I have one person sign up to speak Dan Jewell and Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Dan Jewell, uh, landscape architect, president of Coulter Jewell Thames. Uh, been asked to say a few words in front of you. We've uh, assisted the applicant, Mr. Scott Bednaz, with this application. He is the uh, owner of Straw Valley. Also with me here tonight is Jeremy Anderson with my office, who uh, can help me with some of the technical details since, uh, since he did a lot of the work on the plans as well. Uh, Amy, thank you for a very good staff report. We, we've uh, those of you who have been in Durham for a while and know the, the history of this area, especially New Hope Commons, um, this property under consideration tonight was actually part of the property, same ownership that New Hope Commons uh, was, was built upon. But the, uh, the owners of, of that property at the time uh, wisely felt that this particular tract along 15501 uh, deserved something maybe a little, a little more special than just doing a, a big box power center, which of course is what we have at New, New Hope Commons. It's, it's great to just there. It creates a lot of jobs and tax base for Durham, but it may not necessarily be the best thing to see from, from 15501. So what we are proposing to do is a uh, committing to a vertically integrated mixed use development with a mix of residential, retail, and office. 
Uh, keep in mind this proposal does not include the mini storage facility, Swedish imports, or the bicycle chain, which are uh, directly east of here going over to Mount Marai Road. Hopefully someday those things will be up for consideration, redevelopment as, as well to help add to creating a, a better image along one of our major gateways into, into Durham. Um, just a few key points I'd like to, to, like to get across. Uh, one, uh, Amy mentioned the roadway improvements. You know, access in and out of New Hope Commons in this site has, has been challenging, particularly if you take New Hope Commons Drive over to Mount Moriah Road. Uh, heaven forbid you should ever try and make a left turn onto Mount Moriah from New Hope Commons or, or go straight across into Indigo Corners. Well, our, our traffic engineers have worked out a solution with NCDOT and uh, the city traffic folks to, uh, to make that better. We are able to actually handle the traffic now without uh, a, uh, a reduction in level of service at any of the interchanges by adding a what I'll call a partial light at New Hope Commons Drive and Mount Moriah Road. It will not impede northbound traffic on Mount Moriah Road. They will continue to be able to function too. But what it will do is force and allow folks to make a right turn coming out New Hope Commons Drive. We'll be adding an additional right turn lane on Mount Moriah Road onto Chapel Hill Boulevard, and we'll also have controlled left turns. What it will do is it will prevent people from trying to make a left turn on Mount Moriah Road uh, and, uh, and going straight across. And as we all know, because we've been out there, there are other opportunities for getting out of Mount Moriah Road if you want to make a left and go up toward uh, toward Urban Road, the signalized intersection farther up. Interestingly also, um, if you, if you <laughs> happen to look at the uh, traffic portion of the staff report, this proposal actually um, creates over 2,000 fewer trips than the current zoning designation does. So we have what we think is a relatively modest proposal for mixed use, particularly the, the 50 units and only 75,000 square feet of, of non-residential. Uh, kind of to put that in perspective, that non-residential portion is not much larger than just the Dick's Sporting Goods over at New Hope Commons and the building next to it. And rather than doing a one level, we are committing to doing multiple levels, which means that the buildings will be much smaller in scale relative to, to everything else going around down here. Uh, the, the big item, uh, items on your agenda tonight obviously are conversation on the, the compact neighborhoods. Uh, and th this area is already within the suburban transit area, suburban transit support district it used to be called, which contemplates that compact neighborhood coming in the future. The compact neighborhood's not there yet. Uh, it may be soon or it may not be soon, depending on what our city council and county commissioners uh, do when it, when it finally gets to that. But w with that in mind, when we had our early conversations with the planning department, we were asked to at least uh, think and demonstrate how we might make our proposal as uh, compatible as possible to what is anticipated as the, the future compact neighborhood and a future compact design district type po uh, 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 zoning. So what I'd like to say is uh, a couple things. One, if you're familiar with our two d compact design districts in Durham, we have down, downtown and 9th Street. They, they both have a core district which is the higher density, taller stuff. And then they have two support districts around the edges where the intensity and the height transitions down ultimately to what's called the support two district, which is intended to be next to the single family neighborhoods that surround these with lower heights and that sort of thing. Um, what we are proposing is very much in keeping with what we think this will end up being, which is probably the support one district, because we're, we're not adjacent to a single family residential neighborhood. We're adjacent to Interstate 40 and the service loading backside of, uh, of Best Buy. That's what this site is actually adjacent to, other than the, the mini storage on the other side. So I'll take uh, the, the compact design district around 9th Street, which is the only one non-downtown that exists as an example. Uh, that compact design district allows maximum building heights in that support one district of 60 feet. We, this proposal, is limited by ordinance to 50 feet maximum height unless we request more height. We are not requesting more height. So we are actually going to be lower than the S1 district would, would allow once the compact design district is adopted. The minimum and maximum residential densities in the 9th Street S1 district 
is 16 to 53 units to the acre. We are proposing only 11 units to the acre. So we think we're still supportive of, 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 uh, of being in the spirit of that design district, but we are also not pushing the limits in terms of the intensity and height of the use that we are proposing. As I said, there's, there is actually no limitation on resident, non-residential flurry in the design districts, and we are proposing to impose a cap of 75,000 square feet total, again, a little bit bigger than Dick's Sporting Goods. Um, committing to the vertical mixed use uh, and uh, one thing lest you think we're proposing to do one big building in the middle of a sea of parking uh, design commitment number four on the uh, on the on, on our development plan I think Amy read it states that our buildings will be oriented around a central courtyard area so it will any, be anything but a big building in a sea of parking uh, I hope you agree we'll may be making this proposal. Our proposal is compatible with the future design district ten, intent as possible while still having to meet the current uh, suburban transit support district uh, requirements and the mixed use requirements. Uh, the last thing I want to say before I open it up for, uh, for questions, conclude my presentation, is, is about affordable housing. Uh, of course, we know affordable housing is, is of great interest to the council, to the citizens of Durham, and of you. I think many of you know I have probably been involved in most of the discussions about affordable housing that have come in front of you and, uh, and the City Council over the last uh, 16 months or so. And what I will say is we don't have a policy yet. The Council is treating every project differently. So what I can commit to is we know that the Council will have some expectation of something to do with affordable housing. And we will follow their lead. We will have to have conversations with the City Council about how they want to handle it because every project they've done so far has been different. So we will start conversations with the City Council soon after, hopefully, you move this item ahead to a City Council agenda and ask them what they want to do. Because, uh, as I said, as of yet, the four times we've had conversations with them, there have been four different outcomes and I suspect we'll have a fifth different outcome on this project. So that concludes uh, our presentation tonight. Uh, thank you for your time and certainly uh, here and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Are there other members? Well, before that, there are some seats over here on this side if you would like to sit down. Uh, seats on this side of the, the auditorium. Uh, there's a few seats scattered in the front down here, but there's some seats over here. Uh, are there other members of the audience that would like to speak to this item? Do we have other members of the public that would like to speak to this item? If not, then I close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners. Do I have commissioners wishing to speak? Okay, I have Linda, I have Dr. Winus, and I have uh, Mr. Miller. Linda? Turn your mic on. Um, I, I'm curious where the residential is going to be on this piece of property. We're, we're not sure yet. Um, um, as, as with any project, we've done multiple schemes on what we think it's going to look like. Um, that's not part of your application. I may get uh, yelled at by, uh, by Mr. Young here, but right now we anticipate that being sort of in the, the middle of the property, the residential the portion. Yeah. Well, the reason that I ask is because, you know, studies show that um, living next to a freeway and uh, a, a busy mm -hmm. highway like 501, uh, people are apt to get sick from particulate mm -hmm. matter, and that's a hundred yards. Is is uh, or actually, um, it's it's 100, 165 feet from. It's from it, it's relatively takes, close. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, but in any case, depending on the prevailing winds, you know, you're going to have particulates. You're right in the armpit of those mm -hmm. two highways. And so I think it's important that the residential not be abutting the interstate in the in 501. Yeah, that, well, we, that, thank you. We're taking that under consideration. That's also one of the reasons that we decided to put our our tree save area along the interstate so we could save that natural buffer. buffer. Fortunately, in the... 30 years now since that section of Interstate 40 was built, the uh, 
what was once just grass has now grown up in nice pine trees and, and things like that to create a buffer. But good comments. Thank you. Commissioner Weiner. Could you, uh, I have two. Uh, Turn your mic on. Two topics to discuss with you. Um, could you tell us about what kind of pedestrian and bicycle connections you might expect uh, between this development and I, and I, uh, and, and not New Hope Commons as currently, it would be important uh, now. And then uh, I, how, how would people get to the rail station uh, if, it, if it is built? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, certainly we're going to be putting pedestrian and bicycle accommodations on our property and around the perimeter of the property. Uh, I can't recall if there's a sidewalk on the uh, the south side of New Hope Commons Drive, but that will certainly be a requirement of our our site plan approval. Is is it always is? But yes, I've been I've been wondering about that myself since we've been looking at several things in this area. Uh, uh, several times I have tried to cross <laughs> the intersection of, of Mount Moriah Road and 15501, and it is, it is a nightmare. I mean, you wait for two minutes for the signal to change for you, and then you can make it halfway across, and you have to stop and go again. So I think there needs to be, as part of the uh, strategic infrastructure uh, planning effort study that the, the planning department, the public works department are doing in Durham for the station area. And as you know, right now it's proposed kind of in the area of the Kroger over at Patterson Place. I think one of the things that, that I hope they're looking at, or suspect are looking at, is how do you actually connect uh, the properties uh, on the north side of Chapel Hill Boulevard down to the, the station site? I mean, I've got some ideas. But uh, you know we're we're certainly gonna gonna be you know involved with the planning department on many levels to try and figure that out. Yeah, and then the second, of course, is the affordable housing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, actually, um, your what you say uh, sounds sounds pretty good and, and reasonable. But I'd like to, um, and certainly, I I think that. Um, we should be able to expect out of this uh, development, you know, a few, you know, units to be committed so that people who work over there in Dick's Sporting Goods and Walmart, there might be a couple of people who could uh, live in this development and walk to work. And plus, since the current, the statistics we got about the current affordability, um, uh, uh, that, you know, there's 22 or 24 percent there. Um, affordable rents there, so it probably wouldn't be a huge stretch, you know, at the present anyway, <laughs> uh, to, and if you could just, you know, make that commitment to keep it that way when everything else goes sky high, um, that, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, <laughs> you still have a minute, 25. Okay. Uh, but what you mentioned that there were four different, you'd had four different conversations with the council or four different cases or something mm -hmm. and everything had happened, everything had been different. Uh, what, which ones specifically, what were they? Irwin Terrace. Uh, which more. has been decided. The council has made a decision on that. Oh yeah, that, that zoning was approved back last December, no, two years ago. December of 2014, I think is what when it was approved. Uh, two that you didn't see because they were land transactions, easements and that sort of thing at Durham Central Park, one being the 539 Foster Project, the other one being the Morris Ridge Project where there were in both cases proffers that you know, different amounts that came together at different angles. And of course the fourth of the case you heard a month or two ago that, it, that uh, we presented on uh, Rosewalk, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is a different kind of project because it is a single family project with a small multifamily and accessory dwelling component which made it, let me just say, it made it easier to figure out what to do in advance on that. So in this case, uh, since we're not sure what the council is going to be looking for, uh, we're, we're not sure if it's going to be a, a financial contribution or, or a couple of units. Uh, and every time we've talked to the council, there's been a, a slightly different angle. Uh, that's why we say we, we, we want to, what the council asks us to do is what we will do. And I think you can expect the council will ask us to do something because that has been their track record. Yeah. So has the Rose Walk one already been approved? Has not gone to council yet, no. Nope. Okay. Yeah. okay, well you still have another minute if you want. You 
you still have another minute. That's she, right. she, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Tom. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dan, so I'm, as I look at the, help, help me understand the, the calculation of traffic impact that results in 2,000 fewer trips per day or peak hour trips mm -hmm. per day. Um, that's based upon a calculation of the of maxing out the property the way it's currently zoned, which is a combination of CN and OI. That, that's correct. That is the way the transportation department does that. Yeah. And then uh, for the purposes of your project, then maxing it out would be 50 residential units, maximum number of office square feet, maximum number of commercial square feet. Actually, it's it, it sort of, but we are not, we are certainly not asking to max out the site we could ask for more it would it would do more no no i'm talking about under your development plan what yes. would be the maximums in the residential commercial and office categories if you were to to max each one of those categories out under the limitations you've imposed upon yourself in the development plan we are at 11 units to the acre i believe we could go up to 18 units to the acre uh under the mixed use zoning no no i'm not interested plan. in the zoning i'm interested in your development plan under your development plan, yes. what's the maximum development potential of the property? With what we have proposed before you today? What, you, what is currently proposed? 50 residential units and right. 75,000 square feet of non-residential. That's right. it. That is and the And so maximum. when you add that together and multiply that times the factors, is that what the staff did to compare against the, the current zoning for traffic impact? Yes. Mr. Judge can explain that better than I can because he's a traffic engineer, but my understanding is what they do is they take our proposed square footage of each use and apply the recognized trip generation for each of those uses. Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to hear from staff on that. Yeah. Uh, Bill Judge with transportation. Um, because this development plan submitted a traffic impact analysis with the application, um, that application or that TIA included uh, certain land uses, which is what was assumed in the table that, that would generate it. There is in the deviations on development plans. When you submit a TIA with a development plan, you're essentially limited to those maximum trips up to 3% additional. So, um, and generally it's looking at the peak hour trips, but we basically just converted it to that 103% of what was in the, in the TIA for preparing the staff report. All right. Otherwise. So, and your uh, tax commitments in your development plan don't require you to build, to max out your potentials in those three use categories. That's in correct. In other words, you could have one residential unit and uh, 25,000 office and 50,000 commercial. That's correct. Uh, or even less than that. Yes. Uh, well, and not less than one, but less. Yeah, less but, but less on the others. The others, the others move by square feet and then residential units are by the unit. So um, uh, it, this project could be, could be at build out substantially less intense than the maximums you've imposed. It could, yes. Mm -hmm. But we should assume that you'll max it out for our purposes. Yes. And, and in making that assumption, it still has a lower impact than the maximum potential of the current zone. Yes, sir. That's all I had, Mr. Chairman. Do we have any other questions? If not, yes, uh, Commissioner Huff. To the applicant. <laughs> Out of curiosity, are you tearing down those buildings? So we have not committed to saving them. I know our client, one of the reasons he bought the property is he fell in love with that old you know, the nicest buildings are actually in the back. If you've been in the black house and the old residential stuff, I mean, and if you ever had the pleasure in the, the time it was open of going to the restaurant there, the black house, it was, it was just wonderful. Um, but what, what we have not committed to, though, is even though he fell in love with those buildings and bought them, um, he is not sure about the structural integrity of all of them and what it might take to, to keep them. So. I can go out on a limb and say, uh, say, Scott's would like to keep those buildings. It's his intent, but at the end of the day, if he starts digging in and finds that uh, maybe change the facades on the building out front is so prohibitively expensive. And by the way, I, I, back in the day when I was a young guy, I used to work for the firm in Chapel Hill that designed the buildings out front. 
uh, then, then he might have to take those down. So, uh, you know, that's not a commitment. His intent is to keep the building, but if, if, if structural analysis and that sort of thing showed that the buildings need to come down, or, or some of them, not all of them, then we want to keep that eventuality. But if you notice the committed elements, the design commitments, we're, we're committing to do a, a modernist form of architecture that is, is compatible because that's the aesthetic that he has fallen in love with. Well, part of my reason for asking that is <laughs> because, I, because, again, I wonder where the residential is going to be and if it's going to be too close to the highway. Because if you keep those buildings, I'm yeah, those, of if, if those buildings remain, you, they would not be the residential buildings. So then you would put the residential over there in that section that's right next to the interstate? If you look at the site, there's a lot of room around those buildings that wouldn't necessarily be right next to the interstate. So okay. we, there's some flexibility. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. If there are no other questions, the chair will entertain a motion. Commissioner Bugsby. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and I would just add, I, it's a remarkable property if, you, if you've been there, especially given its location. I think this is a really strong plan and I urge the commitment to continue to look at options for affordable housing as well. Uh, that said, I would uh, move for a favorable approval of uh, case Z140033 to send forward to City Council. Second. M motion by Commissioner Bugsby, second by Vice Chair Hammonds to move this forward uh, with a favorable recommendation. All those in favor, please let it be known by raise of hands. All those opposed, raise hands. Unanimous, nine to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The uh, next case will be A one five zero 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 two zero compact neighborhood tier policy update. Uh, it's item F, but we're receiving it first. So, and this I uh, would open the public hearing. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Hannah Jacobson with the Durham Planning Department. And um, as we just said, these are public hearings for a project that we've been working on in the Planning Department for um, just over a year now. Um, this is our fourth occasion to come before the Planning Commission to give you an update on this project. Most recently was in November when we presented the recommendations as well as gave, gave you um, the draft reports that are um, that document what those recommendations are. Um, I have a few introductory slides. Um, there's a, a lot of people in the audience, so I want to get everybody um, up to speed, but we'll be quick. Um, the purpose of this project overall is to update the future land use map, um, looking at compact neighborhood tier boundaries and future land use designations. We're also recommending two additional policies be added to the comprehensive plan, which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, but overall, this project is to help align our future land use plan with the recently uh, planned uh, Durham Orange Light Rail transit line. Um, it's also to respond to land use changes, development, transportation changes that have occurred in the last 10 years since the comprehensive plan was adopted in 2005. It's given us a chance to engage, re-engage with the members of the community, and they've helped us to identify some issues that are, um, that ought to be addressed prior to any rezoning or prior to even opening day of the light rail expected in uh, 2025 or 2026. Um, this is just one piece of a broader uh, framework that we're working on to do station area planning around the Durham Orange Light Rail Line. Um, in addition to our land use planning, which we're here to talk about tonight, um, there's also plans to, uh, for infrastructure planning that will help to address some of those questions. Um, one of the commissioners raised about how people will get to the transit station, so looking at access particularly uh, bicycle and pedestrian access. Um, there's also an initiative to work on affordable housing. Um, but again, tonight the focus is on our uh, land use planning initiatives. And the way that we've been thinking about uh, the land use planning is in three different steps, and we're at the very first step, which is to 
update the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan provides um, a broad-based policy direction um, for how growth occurs over time. And that's where we are tonight. Um, the next step will be to update the um, specifics of the Unified Development Ordinance. And the final step would be to initiate uh, zoning map changes within these areas. And we would work very carefully with the community to tailor exactly what the requirements, what the zoning regulations would be, and to map out where the highest um, density land uses should be in relationship to um, where the areas of transition would be. Before we initiate any of the zoning map changes, we would hope to have um, the station area strategic infrastructure study recommendations completed, as well as strategies for affordable housing in place. And finally, I mean, after, um, after the zoning map changes occur, um, then change in development of a lot of these areas would be incremental and would really only happen through private development and over, over a significant period of time. So it will not be change overnight. We've been looking at five different areas along the Durham Orange Light Rail Corridor, um, which we'll discuss in subsequent agenda items. Over the last year, we've had 12 neighborhood meetings in which uh, I think roughly 600 members of the public have attended, um, including many members of the Planning Commission. And in those meetings, um, the members of the public have helped us map and outline some of the boundaries that we'll discuss again in subsequent agenda items. Um, but at the onset of the project, staff had established um, some guidelines for looking at compact neighborhood tier boundaries. Some of those included preserving significant environmental features, using large rights of way like highways as, as boundaries, preserving intact single family neighborhoods, avoiding um, university college zoning districts, and then including large undeveloped or underutilized tracts of land. Um, so to get to the matter of, of the uh, of A15-00020, which are updates to the text of the comprehensive plan introducing two new policies, um, they, these are both issues that have been <clears throat> identified um, repeatedly kind of through our public engagement process. The first deals with the idea of um, how development in these areas will transition to areas that are outside of the compact neighborhoods. So we are proposing a policy that describes how that transition may occur, where the area closest to the transit station is known as the core, and then as you move further and further away from the transit station, you decrease the development intensity um, and transition to um, single-family neighborhoods or to um, other sensitive environments. And these sub-districts, we're, we're proposing the policy tonight, and, um, but they would be mapped out in much greater detail as part of the zoning map change process. The second policy has to do with um, affordable housing in transit areas. Um, the city and the uh, city council and county commissioners have adopted a resolution on affordable housing within a half mile of future, future light rail stations. Um, it's not been adopted as part of the comprehensive plan as, as of yet, so that is what we are proposing to do. So I'm happy to take any questions on this agenda item. Thank you. Uh, I have two people signed up to speak. Dick Hale, are you speaking for or against? Dick Hale? Uh, probably. Okay, and Ed Harrison for or against? Okay, so 10 minutes each uh, timer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Good evening, members of the commission, staff. I'm Dick Hales. Uh, I've been active in the coalition for affordable housing and transit in recent years, and um, uh, we've actively participated uh, in many of the public meetings noted. Um, uh, had many opportunities to interact with the staff. We've always appreciated their professionalism and their very tough job of trying to balance lots and lots of different interests around the community in these topics. Um, I think um, in recent months we participated in a number of meetings. We've had some concerns. We spoke at a matter here on some text amendments last fall where we thought there was an opportunity to make more specific references to affordable housing in there. Um, in reviewing the text um, on these matters tonight, we thought there were a couple of opportunities missed. We would like the opportunity to talk further with staff on those. Um, we think most of what's in the policy that Hannah described very well as um, making perfect sense, it's not only the right thing to do around our transit stations to promote higher density and effectiveness uh, for the huge public investment going in, but it's also what's going on in downtown and 9th Street and so on. Uh, we don't have a problem with that, um, but we are sort of looking around the edges at some of the portions of the text that talk about affordable housing. Um, there's certainly a lot of things under discussion um, uh, about more specifics, things like reserving public land for affordable housing and other things, and we'd like the chance to talk a little bit more on that. Uh, I, I say we will take responsibility. I talked to Scott a little bit before the meeting and just said um, uh, over the holidays and so on, we haven't had as much time as we may, might like to inter, uh, interact with staff, um, but on behalf of the coalition, I think we would like to request a 30-day delay on this, chance to meet with staff, and uh, perhaps bring back a few tweaks that might strengthen it further uh, next month. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ed Harrison. Uh, Ed Harrison, 58 Newton Drive, Durham 27707. Uh, that is where I've lived for almost 26 years. It's 500 feet inside the time limits of Chapel Hill, and as some of you know, I've been a council member there for 14 years. Um, and I'm not representing the town formally. We do have a staff person here who's really engaged in, in this process. Uh, but I think I'm gonna come in somewhere between the viewpoint of the, of the nearest residents to, in this case, the Lee Village Compact District and the position of Go Triangle, where I happen to be a board member, have been for a long time, six years. Um, and it's to support the staff recommendation uh, for the first uh, policy in your two recommended amendments uh, for sub-districts of design districts, page 16. And um, I've been watching the process, participating in it for quite a while, have had a, a lot of good conversations with Hannah. I'm very glad that she took my calls, always a good idea uh, to call her, and uh, have talked with other people about it too. And uh, what is most appealing for someone who is seeing uh, a half mile long boundary with this compact district um, in Chapel Hill is the potential of having a support to transition area. And that would, there are a lot of, of these districts somewhere in any of the five, would this be a good idea? And my understanding from the staff memos that this has been done in the 9th Street District already. We don't know how it's working yet. Um, and to read it to you, the it's the portion of a design district intended to provide a sensitive transition from more intense development to development adjacent to the district, often residential in nature. And Apparently that could be clearer because I read it to the man who taught me planning law as an environmental manager 40 years ago, and he said, now what does that mean? Um, and you have to step back a little bit, and what it means is that, as I understand it in talking to Hannah, is that there could be a, a, a community concurrence 
the landowners, if they're interested uh, in the district itself and those abutting, uh, to tailor the intensity of development up against that boundary. And as someone who's advocating for the, this high capacity transit system, that's what I call it, it's light rail, but it's high capacity transit, the stations themselves will be very densely developed. If you're a Carolina alumnus, it will look like West Franklin Street now does with votes from people like me. And there are parts of uh, Western, particularly, where it's beginning to look like a rail station, uh, stationary, an immediate stationary, the core district. Um, and that really doesn't work well, based on my experience, particularly the last five years, next to single family residential. Single family residential does not appear to be a use that's going to be happening in compact districts. Uh, but having some kind of gentle transition worked out in a, in a set of layers. In the case of the Lee Farm District, uh, the Lee, Lee Village District, when you get to the map, you'll see two north-south roads. Farrington Road, which is a fast-driving highway that I use to get places, 11,000 trips a day. The one on the west is George King Road, which right now is about 80% gravel and 20% new pavement. Uh, the character of that road will change a great deal over time, but it's the, it's the boundary beyond which the district was moved in this last change. And it took in the whole area west of George King Road, which abuts the Army Corps of Engineers Jordan Project land, and abuts again a half mile of Chapel Hill boundary. But this, this offers a lot of potential for making these districts much more palatable than they would be otherwise if a, in what we call in Chapel Hill, a form-based code were applied to the entire district with the intensity of the core put to every boundary. Uh, that's, that's really hard to envision. It was hard to envision to my old professor today. Uh, I mean, he said, is are we talking six or eight units an acre? And I said, yes, we are, probably. But that's pretty low density compared to what you have in the central district. The 11-story building in West Franklin Street is, in Rosemary Street, is uh, 90 units an acre. Uh, and that's what that's what happens in, in the core station areas. Anyway, I hope you will support this. Think about it. You, you, your role does not go away with this this evening. Um, we really need your thinking about this, and I will be watching every step from Chapel Hill as we start our station area planning as well. But thanks for your service. Thank you, Ed. Do we have other members in the audience that would like to speak to this policy update? If not, we will bring it back before the commissioners. Do I have commissioners wishing to speak? I got Commissioner Miller, Commissioner Winders, Commissioner Hyman, Commissioner Winders. Okay. Um, I, I, again, there are two things. Uh, there, I'm. Uh, asked Hannah a question in an email today and she gave me a very nice answer and and ma and I thought I understood it and I looked at a matrix of um, that shows the um, land use designations this amend amendment amending the plan this overview and policy change is going to assign la a land use designation to the compact districts and all of the land within the compact districts will be designated design district. Am I correct, Hannah? Hannah. <laughs> and, and then the, what are the only zone that fit, fits, that will be consistent with that land use designation is the design district, compact design or downtown design, isn't that right? The, That's The correct. design zones. That is correct. I just have one quick um, exception to the rule, and that is the recreation and open space is also allowed within the compact neighborhood tiers. Okay. So. And the station area plans, we don't expect to have completed the land use plans for the stations that will be uh, comparable to the 9th Street uh, Compact District land use plan, they will not be done for three to five years, as, as my understanding. Is that, it's not on the, 
how, what's the timetable for that? Where, and the sub, the sub districts, the court sub areas will be done at that stage. Correct, so as I described earlier, we have a three step process. The first step is to update the comprehensive plan and the future land use map. The second step would be to look at some of the, um, to tweak some of the regulations to our existing di design districts. Um, that process is already underway in house and it, we're expecting to bring that forward to the public in uh, late spring, early summer. Um, and then the next step in the process is to relook at some of these areas, at, at all of these areas, work more carefully with the community, tailor some of those regulations, and apply where those sub-districts would be located on the ground. And you're right, we don't have a time frame yet. We haven't received priorities from the city council and the county commissioners about which areas we might need to look at first. Um, this will likely be a very uh, staff intensive, time intensive um, process. Um, so it, again, we, we don't have our, our um, work plan worked out that far into the mm -hmm. future. So what will happen when Mr. Jewell comes up and wants to develop or, or is working, presenting for somebody who wants to develop a property who, that is maybe zoned R20 uh, but is in on the plan shows it as being design district. Good evening. I'm Scott Whiteman from the planning department. So if, when, if and when this is approved, they would either the the property owner would have to develop under their existing zoning, or would have to apply for a design district zone, a compact design district. So what, since we haven't done the standards and we won't know which is the core and which is the sub-core, uh, the sub-district, then how can we have a rezoning? What, how will we know what the standards and, are? And to be clear, we're not, we're, not, we're not hoping to have a bunch of piecemeal rezonings in these areas, uh, and we don't really anticipate there being a whole lot of those, but that's one of the reasons why, as Hannah presented, the policies for the sub-districts, we're requesting that that be added to the comprehensive plan. So if the situation comes up where you have to consider the rezoning of one property in an area, you can use those policies to help guide your decision as to what sub-district would most be appropriate. So people will, will ask, we, we, we're not gonna, dis, gonna zone uh, where the sub-districts are, we're just gonna just, the developers will ask for what level of, of sub-districts they think is appropriate for their, their we, project. We will, and as Ms. Jacobs has said, we, it is uh, our intention to work with, within each of these areas individually to do a, a more detailed plan and rezoning as like what happened in Ninth Street. But we have to understand Wait, that there's- Years later. There will be. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're hoping to begin that next year if that's, uh, if the, the, for one, at least one of them, if that's uh, in the desires of the council and commissioners and the Joint City County Planning Committee, but uh, it, it will take a while. Okay, okay, that, um, so your answers, you know, make me agree with, with, uh, with uh, Mr. Hales that, that um, maybe we should defer this while we think about it a little bit. And, um, but also because of the affordable housing thing, um, I, we, we don't have, since we don't have the program defined about what the expectations are with regard to affordable housing, it makes me nervous to make these changes to the comprehensive plan without uh, putting the conceptual framework into the, the uh, land use element of the comprehensive plan to support the development of the affordable housing program. Okay, and just, uh, <clears throat> Ms. Cole, as the time is running, when they're answering the questions for the commissioners, that time is not charged against them. Okay, so that's why my time and your time is different. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Howard. 
Um, I agree with Commissioner Winders. In light of the, the questions and the suggestions that additional tweaks um, are necessary, I would like to recommend or uh, make a motion that we table this item for 60 days. After the discussion. Okay. Okay, you get the rule? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hannah, if you could step to the mic. I just want to make sure I understand what's going on here. Um, with regard to the item that's in front of us, which is F on our agenda, even though we're talking about it out of alphabetical order, uh, this is a change, a proposed change to the text of the comprehensive plan regarding our now refined vision about design district uh, planning um, in the future. We're not proposing to make any map changes uh, future land use map changes as a part as a part of the consideration of this document. That's correct. We have created a downtown design district and a 9th Street de design district, which which em employ this uh, idea of concentric uh, design district zoning categories of core sub one, sub two, and special. 9th Street's got the pedestrian business, um, and so what this is doing is essentially ca catching the text of the comprehensive plan up to what we're doing so that it can work as a guide to what we'll do in the future if we create more design districts. Help me make sure I understand correctly. We are not decreeing, though, in this text change that all uh, compact neighborhood tiers, the ones that exist now and the ones we may create in the future, will necessarily become design districts. That's correct. Uh, nor are we saying that all design districts necessarily have to fall within inside the boundaries of a comprehensive of a compact neighborhood tier. Hold on for just a moment. I okay. Don't know if that's true. I've evidently wandered off the edge of the page here. <laughs> okay. I do um, that from time to time. After conferring with my colleagues, um, design districts need to be located within the boundaries of a compact neighborhood tier. I, is that actually or the downtown tier. is that in the code actually oh it is in the code all right oh, good that's good to know I'm glad I asked um, so but it's not necessary that every compact neighborhood tier be converted to a design district correct even though that is currently kind of what we're we're looking that's at the in, that's the intent yeah. of we can do it but we don't have to do it and currently we have compact neighborhood tiers which are not design districts even though we'd like to change them. And they function because the zone, the existing zoning districts inside those uh, are interpreted uh, inside their tier boundaries in the UDO. And you can change the zone inside those tier boundaries just like anything else. And we have, in fact, done that in the past. Ninth Street, it comes to mind, and, and I don't know whether we've done it. Uh, we did it Ninth Street before we created the design district. Um, so it's important to my way of thinking, to understand that this text change is catching, at least with regard to part one, is catching the comprehensive plan text up with the practice that we have developed uh, in creating the design districts downtown and at 9th Street. And then, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I uh, appreciate that opportunity to make sure that I was understanding it correctly. With regard to part two, I read this, and while I agree with what's being said there, I don't really see it as a matter of, it's, it's not a guide to development planning in Durham. It looks to me more like a work plan item, uh, something that we should do and I support us doing, but it really doesn't tell deve the development community or the planning community how they should respond to proposals to develop property. Uh, and so, and I heard Mr. Hale say that he was looking for refinements, and so, and I also heard uh, my colleague on the commission, Ms. Hyman, say that perhaps a 60-day delay would be a good idea, uh, a continuance rather. Uh, so I, I agree too, especially if the Affordable Housing Coalition has specific language, they'd like the staff and the uh, the community, including the Planning Commission, to consider. I'd like that to be brought forward. Uh, so I'm going to support the continuance uh, at the time Ms. Hyman makes that motion. Commissioner uh, Whitley. Um, I have a question. I have really two questions. Um, 
would this apply to all of the compact districts? No, this is just this, this item. Just this item. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no affordable housing plan for any of them. So why wouldn't it apply to all it, of them? You, it would apply to all of them, yes, if, right. if it's adopted. Right. And the second question I need to ask staff, have Austin Avenue, um, do Austin Avenue meet the criteria for a design district? Okay, you are, that's kind of out of order. We're, that's we're not on that yet. It's coming. It's coming, but we're not on that yet. That's not a matter before the floor right now. So I have to wait. But if we make the decision to postpone it for 90 days, Six. we'll still get to it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Additional questions? If not, the chair would entertain a motion. Uh, I'd like to motion, uh, make a motion that we have a continuance of 60 days for item number uh, 815020. Mr. Chairman, I second that motion. There's been motion and second that we have a continuance of A1500020 for a six a day continuance. Understanding that if we continue this item, which will apply to the other items following this, that it will continue those items also. Is that the. Yeah. Let's go ahead and do the district boundaries. Uh, Mr. Chair, they're, each one is in a, a separate case, so okay. it's really it's up to the commission. You can it's just, you can choose to continue all of them, put them on the same meeting, or you can okay. dispose of them each okay. separately. So right now we will dispose of them each separately, so we will yes. continue. Okay, so understanding the motion <clears throat> to continue the policy update, all those in favor of continuing the policy update, uh, let me hear a roll call. Mr. Ghosh. In favor. Mr. Busby. Aye. Ms. Hyman. Aye. Ms. Huff. Yes. Mr. Harris. Aye. Mr. Kinchin. Yes. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Whitley. Aye. Ms. Winders. Aye. Unanimous, nine to zero. To continue. To continue. Okay. Thank you. The next item is actually the item. Chair Harris, could I interject for a moment? Yes. I just want to raise this now so that it doesn't become an issue later. Uh, I work for Morningstar Law Group. They are here representing one of the cases today. Uh, it is the uh, South Square. Yeah, South Square compact neighborhood and okay. So I want to be sure to recuse myself timely. Um, when that case comes before the Planning Commission. Okay. I, I don't have a problem. Anybody on the Commission have a problem with that? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the next item is actually item A, Lee Village, uh, A1500014. Mr. Chair, we'd ask for a brief pause because one of the uh, one of the speakers would like to load a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Run. Street out. So what you wind up with is this. Uh, what you wind up with is this, which is over here. Mm -hmm. 
openness and leave that out. Chris Street wanted to be out of it because if you're in a compact neighborhood to you, single family homes become, and it goes to the design district, you can't have single family homes. My problem with this is this is now completely divorced from this. <laughs> It's got an interstate <laughs> highway in between. Yeah, and so the staff is saying, give me a week. Yeah, give me a week and maybe. Uh, except for if they're going to do that, then let's consider it. Let's start over again. I'm not going to look at it. Excuse me. I agree. The fact that they put Chris out. Okay. <clears throat> all right. I have two items I need to take care of before we start this. First of all, uh, Ms. Cole. Commissioner Huff did not get a signature package. Here's, okay, you can have this. Okay, the second item, we have two commissioners, Commissioner Huff and Commissioner Hyman that needs to uh, leave before we finish this case. So if I can get a motion that they can be re uh, we we have seven. We have fifty percent. Uh, so if I can get a motion that they can be uh, early release. Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, allow commission members. I'm so sorry to interrupt. If you excuse these two members, we're not going to have a quorum. You need fifty-one percent. Eight eight members. Okay. I had constant to seven fifteen. Let's keep going. Okay. Yeah. So when we're down one on appointments, does that still obtain? I mean, it's clearly safe to look at it that it applies even if we're down one. Yeah, let's see. Okay, a quorum, it's a number required. I remember who has withdrawn from here. Yeah. Um, Chair Harris. Yeah. Uh, Chairman Harris, uh, per your rules of procedure, it says the quorum shall consist of eight members. The number required for the quorum shall not be affected by vacancies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But uh, Commissioner Huff has to leave, but Commissioner Hyman we'll be here for a, another 30 minutes so we can continue so in that case mr chairman i move that we excuse commission member huff second second all those in favor let it be no miss and i i opposes Okay, uh, Pam Jacobs, Ms. Jacobs. Okay. Um, this is case A15-00014, the Lee Village Compact Neighborhood. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the area, Lee Village is nearby the intersection of NC Highway 54 and Interstate 40. Um, it's largely developed in a low density suburban character with a kind of a semi-rural feel to it. And despite um, how rural it appears today, it's uh, near some of the most highly congested transportation corridors in the state, NC-54 and Farrington Road. Um, there's also some significant natural features, including the Little Creek bottomlands in the area as well. Um, the future land use map today shows a suburban transit area of 356 acres made up of commercial office and, and higher density residential land uses. Uh, the proposed um, compact neighborhood would be a 423 acre compact neighborhood um, designated as design district with some um, recreation and open space in, inside. Um, there are two additional um, sort of cleanup amendments to uh, the future land use map that are proposed. One is for yeah, Eastwood Park, which is uh, an established single family neighborhood um, largely built in the 1960s. It's currently designated as commercial. Um, through our public engagement process, we heard uh, strong support for 
uh, the neighborhood to remain as residential. So that is consistent with our proposal here. Um, it's not a unanimous uh, consensus among the, the neighbors, but that was the overriding sentiment at the public engagement meetings that we held. Um, a second sort of cleanup um, change to the future land use map would be looking at a property that's owned by the North Carolina Botanical Garden Foundation. Um, there's an existing conservation easement on this site. So consistent with other uh, privately held conservation easements, we're recommending that it be designated as recreation and open space. Um, looking at the boundary itself that we have developed in, uh, along with the, according to the guidelines that we laid out at the onset of the project and uh, in working with members of the community, um, we've expanded the boundary to the west of George King Road to align with um, the Town of Chapel Hill boundary. Um, this will help to facilitate the Collector Street plan um, and um, as we've mentioned before, we'll work um, in the zoning stage to help to clarify kind of what the transition to that single family neighborhood will be in Chapel Hill. Um, the boundary does not include the village, uh, the villas at Culp Arbor to the north, um, but it does use Interstate 40 as the boundary to the east. It includes the Falcon Bridge Shopping Center, which is near number four, um, because of the NC 54 corridor study recommendations that. Um, would help to facilitate some movement from the north side of 54 where the station is to the south side of 54. Um, we have, again, we've removed the area Eastwood Park um, from the compact neighborhood uh, boundary and this boundary does not infringe upon the Little Creek Bottomlands property owned by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, there are some, we, we recognize that this is just a first step in planning for the Lee Village area. Um, there are a number of key issues that we'll need to address as we move forward. Um, primary among those is extending some public utilities. This area is in, mostly in the county today, so public utilities are not present. Um, building sufficient transportation infrastructure to relieve the very real traffic congestion issue that's in this area. Um, coordinating and phasing development so that it makes sense in this kind of a greenfield setting is something kind of unique to this site. And then again, how we transition to adjacent um, environmentally sensitive areas and the low density residential areas will be another issue that we'll need to pay close attention to moving forward. Um, finally, staff does recommend approval of this plan amendment. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. Uh, Gail Abraham, Abraham uh, are you speaking in favor or against? Okay, I have six people speaking in favor of it. I have four people speaking against it. And I have one person making comments. Okay, I give uh, the, okay, so I will have, each person will have two minutes each, if you would, if you would. So I have uh, John, Ed, Eddie, Eddie, Hebe, and following him I have Jared Harris, Wendy Martin, Dan Jewell, Chris, Selby, My name is John Eady. I live at 5708 Crescent Drive in Chapel Hill, which is in Durham County. <clears throat> I am president of the Woodland Acres Homeowners Association, which is comprised of many of the residents who live in the proposed Lee Village Transit District. My Homeowners Association is not a member of the INC, and many of the resolutions put forward by the INC do not represent the position of myself or my neighbors. My neighborhood association has long been involved with the potential development of this area. We have participated in the last 15 years or so in numerous public workshops and meetings, including the 54 I-40 corridor study, the Collector Street Plan, the Durham Orange Light Rail Transit Workshops, 
and most recently the compact neighborhood meetings. <clears throat> we believe that approval of the compact neighborhood design will give some of the much needed clarity necessary for the future development of this area and protection from the piecemeal development that is now occurring. Now we do share some of the concerns expressed in the INC resolution for more inclusive in-depth process for public involvement in planning compact neighborhoods. Having participated in the planning department's public meetings to determine the broad concepts and boundaries of the Lee Village compact neighborhood, we do not want to be left out of the more detailed planning. The large tracts of open area in the Lee Village district have great potential, but coordination among many developers is crucial to the success in building an exemplary transit village. Since we live in the area and have a vested interest in the outcome, we want to have a mechanism for providing our input on the implementation of the design district. We like the INC's proposal of a local planning committee for each transit district and <clears throat> think that this would be a good mechanism for providing neighborhood input. Can you finish up in a minute? I can. Okay. It would also allow input for other issues such as affordable housing. But the first step is to approve the overarching guidance given at the compact neighborhood amendment to the comprehensive plan. Therefore, the Woodland Acres Homeowners Association supports the approval of the amendment to the comprehensive plan for the Lee Village compact neighborhood, but with a request from Durham City County, to Durham City County Planning that they will develop such a mechanism for continued input from the affected property owners during the more detailed planning phases of the design district. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jared Harris. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Jared Harris. I lived, my family lived in the uh, Lee Village area for several years, quite a while back, and we own two houses and some land in the district. Uh, we've been getting offers to do typical single family development on our land for 35 years, and we've always turned those down because um, we always felt we should wait for something better than just that. Um, and for the last 15 years, as John was saying, we participated in a lot of planning efforts uh, when Lee Village was not named that, when it was just a transit district, and then as it became named Lee Village, and then as this amendment went forward. And we're very grateful to the planning department for taking on this work and for producing this amendment, which we fully support. Um, our concern is that during this very long planning period, uh, these offers keep coming forward to take pieces, seven acres, five acres, 10 acres, uh, and carve them off from the district. Uh, and in fact, on the map, uh, just above Eastwood Park, you can see a triangle that was just recently carved off from the district, hasn't even been built yet, was approved, was actually went through the approval process with the recommendation of planning because they were following the rules. And we see no reason why that just can't keep happening. It's going to keep happening, we believe, until this is made into a compact neighborhood and the rules are changed. Um, so we think that. Um, as long as that hasn't happened, developments that don't contribute to solving the traffic problem, they don't support long-term sustainable development, they don't contribute to affordable housing. All these developments that have happened don't, are outside that. So we think it's a C, extremely important to move forward now with a compact neighborhood designation for Lee Village to prevent this kind of bad development which has been occurring, which has occurred right up to the boundaries of the current district and which will continue in the district if, if the commission and the city council don't rule otherwise. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy Martin. Good evening, commissioners. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm Wendy Martin and I lived in Durham on Wendell Road for many years. My daughter was born there and I love this neighborhood. I'm speaking in support of the compact neighborhood designation for Lee Village. 
compact neighborhoods have a much more positive impact than in many people understand. High density development neighborhoods can actually preserve green space, creeks, and wetlands better than developments of single family homes. As it stands now, every single housing development that is approved whittles away at the diversity of compact neighborhoods and the opportunity to preserve open space and affordable housing. It is important to note that it, the current situation kicks the can down the road in regard to confronting and finding solutions for traffic challenges, which we've been hearing about. We need to approve compact neighborhoods now. Allowing piecemeal development means losing an important opportunity to preserve open space and for affordable housing. Finally, if we have a compact neighborhood designation, this will help with federal funding for light rail. Thank you for the opportunity to talk Thank to you. you. Thank you, Dan Jewell. Good evening again, Commissioners. Dan Jewell, 1025 Gloria Avenue. I've been asked by the neighbors to come up and give a one minute and 55 second history lesson. <laughs> uh, uh, Hannah's report starts at, at 2015. Mine goes back to 2001 when the neighbors knew the light rail was coming. They saw uncoordinated development whittling away around the edges, no advanced planning for infrastructure, traffic infrastructure, uh, a, a good diverse range of development. So they asked a group I'm involved with, Durham Area Designers, to hold a charrette and workshop. We had the neighbors there. Uh, at that time, there were actually two transit stations, one at Farrington Road, one at, at Lee Village. Uh, had so much fun, we did it again two years later when the other transit station was dropped and had even more folks there. Since then, as you've heard, what these folks have done is they have been intimately, actively involved in getting this adopted on the comprehensive plan in 2005, being involved in all of the road planning efforts, literally driving where the alignment of the light rail would go and where the station would go so it is best suited for a transit neighborhood to develop around it. And in fact, they have been so impatient with this effort to move forward so they could stop all of these low-hanging fruit developments that are coming forward that don't contribute to transit supportive development. They actually submitted a privately led application to create the compact neighborhood two years ago. And the planning department said, we're going to work on this, no problem, go ahead and withdraw, which they did. But the time is now because as the economy approves, and single family developers are looking for building lots at any cost. I can guarantee you every one of these property owners out here is getting weekly phone calls to sell their property to do quarter and half acre lot subdivisions. What kind of affordable housing is that going to create? Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Chris Shelby. Selby. Shelby. Chris Selby. I, I've lived at 138 Celeste Circle in Eastwood Park uh, in the city of Durham for over 19 years. And thank you for this opportunity to speak, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm here to express my sp strong support for recommendation in the Lee Village item. I think it's number three, and it's to change the future land use map designation of Eastwood Park from commercial to residential. Uh, I enjoy living in my neighborhood. And as to the future, there are changes anticipated all around Eastwood Park, including light rail, Lee Village, and widening of NC-54. I believe that these changes offer opportunities to improve our quality of life. I ask the members of the Planning Commission respectfully to help preserve and protect the future of Eastwood Park as a residential neighborhood and recommend a residential future land use map designation for us. Finally, even if the Commission finds fault with the other recommendations associated with the Lee Village Compact Neighborhood item, I ask that a recommendation be made for the Eastwood Park Residential Future Land Use Map designation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Scott. Good evening. Good I'm evening. Lynn Scott. I live at 211 Celeste Circle, which is in Eastwood Park. I haven't had a Chapel Hill address, but in Durham City and County. I've lived there 
two, three years, so I'm a very new resident, and I just wanted to come out and speak on behalf of the neighborhood and say that we are very much in favor of staying residential. If you look at item six on the map, where the rectangle in the front, it's uh, um, houses, houses about 50, and I'll say that the piece behind it, which is the triangle that was referred to, that's Chapel Creek, um, it is designed to be a higher density. It's one to eight, and so you've already got started that transition circle that Hannah talked about from residential on the edges being lower and then moving up towards the center. So I hope you'll support keeping Eastwood Park residential. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Phil Post. And Phil will begin to speak to those who are against this recommendation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my name is Phil Post. I have a presentation if we can just get a call up. My name is Phil Post. I live at uh, 104 uh, St. Andrews Place, and I've lived in Durham County in this area for 38 years. Um, my neighborhood uh, is strongly against the uh, encroachment and expansion of, of the Lee Village compact neighborhood to the west and to the north that uh, severely violates the collector road plan that myself and many of my neighbors spent a lot of time on. And that was, a, 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 it wasn't perfect, but, but our neighborhood agreed with the representatives of Orange County, Carborough, Chapel Hill, Durham to establish the collector road plan. What, what you see on your screen now is the collector road plan and the density map that was uh, in place at the time that the collector road plan. So the high density around the station was here and there was low density to the north. But the key element of the collector road plan, and I'm glad that uh, Mrs. Jacobson mentioned that as a planning principle when you were laying out the uh, compact neighborhood was that the, the uh, roadways are very often used as boundaries. So it was very well thought out when we did the agreed on this collector road plan that the collector roads would circumscribe uh, on the north and, and on the west uh, the compact neighborhood. Um, this, this happens to be the density map that was used for the collector road plan just to show you that I've acted, and this is your current plan. And the blue areas are these expansion areas where you've sprawled across our well thought out collector road plan. So here's, here's what happens. Um, instead of these collector roads forming the boundaries of uh, the compact neighborhood, we've now sp sprawled across uh, all these collector roads and our, the strong opposition of myself and my neighbors in, in Durham County, in the Oaks neighborhood, is that this is, uh, that the collector road plan needs to be altered before you would take the first step uh, to implement this, this vast expansion of the compact neighborhood. Our neighborhood is not satisfied that these uh, intensity transitions are going to protect these existing Durham County residents. So we'd ask you to, um, to not allow these pink areas on the west and north to be added uh, to this, uh, this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Chris Hank. Hello, um, I'm uh, Chris Hankey, 101 Tweed Place, Chapel Hill. I, I live in the Oaks Villas neighborhood, which is along that west boundary that was just being discussed. Um, so I represent our uh, homeowners association. We're obviously the, you know, existing neighborhood that gets impacted the most by that expansion to the west of the boundary beyond George King. Our, I can't really speak for everyone in our association and we don't have, we're not against the compact neighborhood development um, at, uh, in general, but many of our uh, residents participated in early planning meetings and the big thing we requested was some sort of visibility into what the buffer zone would look like. You know, we don't own the land, so we can't control all that. But we, we, we got no feedback on the process on how any buffer zone would get, would get defined there. Um, and I lived in Blenheim Woods development, which was abutting a different part of the Oaks. And uh, the developers take full advantage of impeding on any kind of buffer zone, right? And what would have been, you know, maybe 50 feet of wooded area becomes all of a sudden 20 feet 
you know, and this is an area that's been in existence since 1989. You know, this area is densely wooded. You know, it's going to completely change the character. And we'd like to have the ability, I think the first gentleman articulated it well, to be involved intimately in the process of how, you know, these zones are defined, specifically in our, our concerns, how a buffer zone is defined. So we don't get, you know, we, we, we know develop isn't, development's inevitable, inevitable. We can't fight it, uh, but we'd like to have some control or participation in the process, uh, and, and that's our main position and our main concern. Thank, thank you. Uh, Debbie McCarthy. Good evening, my name is Debbie McCarthy. For 30 years I've lived at 4517 Trenton Road and I've been very involved in land use and thoroughfare planning for all those years. Three preliminary points. I would like to say that the Lee Village compact neighborhood is not compact. 400 plus acres is massive. Secondly, I'd like to say that the zoning seems awfully nebulous. As you all said earlier, no one really knows what is gonna be allowed within that design district and that compact neighborhood tier. Thirdly, the densities within this Lee Village area are too intense, the impervious surface too great, and the traffic and environmental impacts too severe. We're talking about the New Hope and the Little Creeks, both of which are very significant. But I know change is coming to the Farrington Corridor, as much as I love it the way it is. I want to focus on one key factor tonight that is really a life and death issue for our neighborhood. That's the location of the light rail romp, the rail operations and maintenance facility. Now's the time when the planning department is defining what's going to be allowable in this compact neighborhood. And updating the UDO to allow a light industrial use in the setting would help pave the way for the rezoning of a romp site within Lee Village's massive acreage. The landowners in this area, you've heard from them, they intend to sell out and leave. They would not object to a romp properly sited within the compact neighborhood's vast acreage, as long as it's not too close to Culp Arbor or Celeste Circle. Development intensities within the compact neighborhood are going to be extreme, 60 to 100 units to the acre, seven-story buildings, impervious surface the norm, and a romp would not be out of place in the midst of all that. By focusing the development within the, like the romp within the compact neighborhood, there would be only one location to remediate with respect to stormwater runoff, not two, as would happen if the romp is further north on Farrington. So there would be no residential relocations, no imminent domain lawsuits, no incompatible land use, no underground diabase dikes, no Trenton Road to rebuild, no wells to contaminate, no Creekside Elementary School to safeguard, no major transportation card or overlay zone or sewer easements, no angry homeowners to contest rezonings. Finally, and best of all, Lee Farm Park, which is Southwest Durham's remarkable, unique 86-acre oasis of woodlands and wetlands would not be harmed. It would be spared. Current and future generations could continue to enjoy the sole refreshing benefits of its natural, historic, educational, and recreational offerings. Thank you. Thank you. Ellen Mitchelson. Michelson? I can't, I can't. Michelson, thank okay. you. I have a visual that I could pass around. I just couldn't print it, if you don't mind. It's just one thing. Okay. I'm Ellen Michelson. I live at 4324 Trenton Road and have been within two miles, and it's Durham County, just so you know. I've lived within two miles of the Lee Farm Village area for the past 30 years. And our street is just over the 40, on the other side of 40 from where Lee Farm and the Romp, the, the Lee Compact Lee Village is. And I wanted to point out that although the planning department has done an incredible job, I want to thank the commissioners, the committee, Hannah, it just seems like we've been doing these meetings for the past 20 to 30 years and they've done one year's worth of research, done an incredible job of getting 
my understanding is 1,200 comments that are supposed to be responded to by February, and we're sort of putting the cart before the horse. We're creating the problem before we've gotten this. It's like what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And the area at 54 in Farrington doesn't seem to be addressed by the compact density. I wanted to point out by this picture that you can't tell me the environment's not going to be affected. That picture was taken yesterday when right at the intersection on Farrington Road, thank you, this deer was hit and you can't tell, I mean there's a beautiful farm, I mean I just happened to be going by and there was vultures and about two weeks ago I had a coyote in my front yard, I mean you've heard it all before some of us don't want it there. There are, on our street, which is just on the other side of 40 from where this is proposed, 40 is gonna have to be expanded for the romp and for the light rail. I'm all for public transportation, hybrid use, bike riding, walking, but it's just not the right place. And again, we have um, a lot of development going where it doesn't need to be. You should take something that's already partially developed and expand it more, not trees, wildlife. The deer are being pushed out, the coyotes are being pushed out, and they have nowhere to go. And it's just not fair to the people who move to Southwest Durham because of the nature of the vicinity as it stood 30 years ago when we moved there and we're still there. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And Gail Epp. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay. Hi, my name is Gail Abrams at 4123 Newburn Place in Durham. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm also the executive director of Piedmont Wildlife Center. We are located in Lee Farm Park, which is directly on the other side of 40. Um, I'm not so much against the compact village concept um, as I am about where it's placed in this location. I echo both uh, Ms. Michelson and Ms. McCarthy's um, comments about wildlife and the environment. Um, right now there is a, a Lee Village compact neighborhood as well as a, um, a ROMF sited uh, in both very, very close to each other. And with those two sightings, um, both the New Hope Creek and Little Creek are both being impacted by these very, very close uh, uh, industrial and compact neighborhoods. Um, and I would say if Lee Village is going to happen, which I, I, I don't agree should be because of the environmental impacts, I agree with Ms. Michelson that this is not the right place to have this intensity. Um, it, it put the romp inside the, the village um, so that only one of these um, environmental uh, corridors is, is affected. Right now, uh, Lee Farm Park, um, we wiped out our boardwalks and our bridges just from the, the storms that we had uh, over Christmas time. Um, and with the addition of uh, a romp in that same area and Lee Village, um, this park is going to be even more impacted by what's happening. Um, so look at the mitigation of both of these locations and let's combine them into one if you're going to make them happen. Uh, but I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Do we have other uh, citizens in the audience that would love to speak? If you would, come up and uh, give us your name and address and then sign this before you seat yourself. Now speak first, then sign. My name is Dottie Williford, and I live at 5103 Marcella Court in Glenview Park. And we are literally back up to the rail, as it's proposed. The romp, have been, I had a study done um, by the light rail, and they told me it was 300 square feet, or 300 feet the size of a football field behind me, so it did not impact my house. However, the bridge that I can throw a rock at from my house is going to be widened and lifted to accommodate that rail, have the rail behind me in the rock. There's no one that can tell me it doesn't impact my house. My neighborhood, I can't speak for them all, but for myself, I am so against this. I've been told that um, by a realtor, I mean, it's a name project. I can't sell my house without letting them know this is gonna happen, and once you break ground, it will probably drop $100,000. Um, in addition, Two at grade crossings on Farrington Road. I mean, the traffic, we can't go left, we can't go right. 
the romp is I understand two or three times larger than the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield building I mean for light pollution I can already you know hear a little bit of 40 but I mean in the winter time all I'm gonna see is the romp building and everyone in my neighborhood the same thing we're pretty close I just don't think Farrington Road is the place for it I have three neighbors who live on Celeste Circle they're not here and I really don't presume to speak for them but I do know personally that their houses have been ruined. One has taken it off the market, and their only hope is that they buy the entire neighborhood. So I just don't agree with the ones that are saying they agree with it. They're just waiting for a big buyout. Now, if someone would bought my house, I would probably agree as well. But it just seems the ones that are for it in my neighborhood stand to gain monetarily. Everyone who wants to live there is not for it. And we're very much against it. And it, just found out about it literally this past fall that it was going to be our the last route that was going to be approved and I've been going to meetings since the fall and that's just the way it seems to be and we try to be heard we've gone to all these meetings and I just don't feel people are listening to us but that's all I have to say hi I'm Sherry Hardman um, I'm president of the Oaks Three Neighborhood Association that's also being affected um, particularly with the um, extension of the compact neighborhood. I think one of the things that I've seen in this whole process that has been very dubious in terms of the communication. Now they, uh, Hannah Jacobs said there was a lot of outreach to the neighborhoods. I really don't think that's true. and. Most people, even in our neighborhood, trying to communicate what's happening, they really don't know that there's this huge neighborhood that's going in right next to them, and they don't know there's a big, um, right across Farrington Road, a large, um, you know, light industrial type of complex. So I think once the neighbors really find out what's happening, they're going to be very upset in Durham County. And these are, you know, high and neighborhoods with um, you know a large tax base and they're being currently upgraded right now their tax bills just all came in and they all went way up so I'm just thinking that there just needs to be more communication and more time um, for the neighbors to truly have input because when these meetings happen the, the neighbors don't get the chance to come up and talk basically this has been one of the first times um, that we've actually been able to say something about this. I, as a matter of fact, I think it's really the first time other than just being able to hand a piece of paper to somebody and saying, I don't think this is the right way to do it. And as far as the extension, we just saw that really a month or two ago. So I would like to see true neighborhood participation. Thank you. Hi, my name is April Apple. I live at 5107 Marcella Court, Durham uh, County. I thank you for the opportunity to come forward and speak to you on this issue. Uh, I am not in favor uh, specifically of the romp. Um, like it's been said before, I do understand that we have to make um, changes. Uh, we need specifically changes to our road systems. And we do need some kind of improved um, uh, system for traveling for people who come out of Durham County uh, to work. Uh, but this small light rail system is, I think, just a joke. Uh, it's not going to improve the road system in any way. It's not going to uh, improve commuter uh, transit. Um, and I like Dottie, I live in the same neighborhood as she does, and we're going to have this huge industrial complex right behind us. Uh, and so I'm very much against it. Uh, again, I can't speak for everyone in my neighborhood, um, but I would like for you to think if it's going up in your, your neighborhood behind your house, would you want it? Uh, and it is going to kill our property tax values. Uh, so uh, I would just like to say I am against it. Uh, and that's all. Thank you. Okay. Do we have other citizens? Did she take my pen? Sorry. <laughs> uh, do, 
Okay. Motion we, to return the pen, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Do we have other citizens that would like to speak? Uh, if not, then we will close the public hearing and bring it back before the commissioners, realizing we don't have the numbers to vote on it tonight, but we do, uh, and we do appreciate you coming out, speaking and expressing your opinion about the proposed zone and change. Now, uh, I'm Chair Mr. Harris, Chairman, Chair I believe Harris, there's a point of order. I'm sorry, may I make a point? Actually, um, Ms. Hyman, um, excuse me, Ms. Huff was excused and Ms. Hyman left as um, without being officially excused. So technically you could take a vote according okay. to the rules of procedure. I just wanted to clarify that. Just Yes. Okay. This actually is not Mr. Chair, I would actually like to make a motion to officially excuse Commissioner uh, Hyman. I, I, I appreciate everyone coming tonight, but I also think it's important that we do have an official quorum before we make an important decision like this. So I'd make a motion that we do officially Excuse Commissioner Hyman. It's a motion on the floor that we excuse Commissioner Hyman. Second motion. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion, please uh, signify by saying aye. Aye. The other thing, a lot of you came here to speak tonight. We still can't, we may not be able to vote, but we can at least get your input and the minutes will be available for the other commissioners who's not here. But I don't want to uh, waste your time. You came here tonight to speak and I would, well, let me hear from staff. Excuse me, Sarah Young. Um, staff would request that if, because now that there is no quorum and we cannot continue with, with the meeting, instead of having to redo this again at some later date, that we just cease the meeting. Um, and with all due respect to everyone that came out, we don't wanna have to do this twice. And now we're going to have to. Okay. All right. Seemed like I have been <laughs> overruled. But thank you for coming. And uh, the next meeting date is uh, yeah. We 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 can. The next meeting date is February the ninth at 5.30. No, no. The, we can still, we have an item under new business uh, that I would like to speak to the commissioners about. The email that was sent out by... Uh, Excuse me, Commissioner Harris. Yes. Because there is no quorum, you've declared that there is no quorum, you cannot continue just to transact business. This is business. information. It's not. Okay, well. This is just information. <laughs> Again, the memo that was sent out by Ms. Smith earlier this week, and it's to discuss the guidelines for the submittal of development plans and committed elements. I hope you guys read that as a policy for the revisions of development plan and for committed elements. Yes, sir. Um, just for information, um, earlier tonight we passed um, a, and I'm glad we passed it, um, because I, I don't like the idea of holding development hostage until something comes and put in place. But the last meeting, we voted to deny a developer because of the lack of affordable housing. And I think we ought to always be consistent and to treat people fairly. I, I, I don't understand your point. We passed, we passed um, a development project unanimously. Um, and we knew that there was not affordable housing component to it. Okay, okay, now I understand what, what you're talking about. Okay, uh, Commissioner Wines. My, my only point is that we ought to work to be consistent. I understand. Yeah, I, <laughs> I agree with you. We did have a conversation. Uh, excuse me. Uh, could you take your conversations in the corridor, please? OK, 
Okay, Commissioner Winders. I was just going to say that it wasn't totally inconsistent because it was comparable to the Rosewalk case where they also came in with more of a commitment than this one was, but he had kind of a good, a good point <laughs> that uh, and that uh, that the consistent. council was doing different things for different people. So he was, but you know, I took it to mean and put in my comments that my and I think it was mentioned in the motion that uh, we were conditioning our approval on the fact that he said, made a commitment that there would be some contribution to the to affordable housing uh, in accordance with what, with the council's expectations. Yeah, well, I, I just, I just want us to be on guard so that we're consistent. I will go make a point okay. in, at, in the middle of the meeting, so. All right. But I make that point now. Thank you. Do we have a look at next month's agenda? Yes, so um, next month you'll have the two cases where we had the error and notice that we had to move to next month, yeah. which is the um, Hope Valley Commons Business Park and the Associated Plan Amendment. You'll also have um, another uh, case where you have a revision to a development plan, previously approved development plan. And then the Cornwallis uh, revision case, the plan amendment and zoning case is actually going to come back to you next month, the revised Cornwallis case. Plus the ones that we didn't get to tonight. Uh-huh. Okay. And we'll have to re-advertise all of those cases because they weren't opened and continued. So we'll have to um, start the whole uh, advertisement proceeding over for the ones that there at the end, that's what we, we were saying. You could have voted. That was our, our preference was that you vote, you open them to continue them versus not take action because now we have to do um, some rather large, extensive uh, advertisement and mail outs because of that. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, if there's nothing else before us, the chair will entertain a motion for adjournment. We're not already. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we can't transact business. <laughs> so we're <laughs> Well. Hey, Grace, I have a question.